Welcome everyone to Great Sound Lab. I'm Jan Künke and today I would like to, to discuss the Harman target. I would like to, um, but if you are already a bit familiar with it, then you would know that Sean Olive was one of the most important people that worked on it. Um, and he wasn't alone in it. And more importantly, he didn't learn everything by himself, but he had a very important mentor. And that person is uh, Floyd Toole. He's probably the most important person in, in audio research. And um, so I would dedicate this first episode to Dr. Floyd Toole um, and just tell you where this train of thought comes from of standardization in audio, uh, because based on that, we can much easier talk about Sean Olive and his work on the Harman target. I'm a big admirer of Axel Grell because he has really shaped the landscape of, of headphones, um, probably more than anyone, except for maybe uh, Dr. Dre and, and the developers of the AirPods. Um, but if we talk about audio luminaries, then I think Floyd, Floyd Tool is probably the most important person in audio per se, in terms of science. And uh, what his basically big contribution is, is that he found out basically that there is a huge problem in audio. And that is something that he called uh, the, the circle of confusion. And by the way, a lot of this work really references uh, Sean Olive's work. So you will find pictures here of Sean Olive's blog. Uh, of course, all published stuff, um, but and I put all the references down in the description, of course, so you can read it up yourself. Um, but now I ex explain the silk of confusion. So uh, Floyd Tool's big contention was that we use, of course, loudspeakers to listen to music or studio monitors, as I've written here. And when we get a new loudspeaker or headphone, what do we do uh, to evaluate whether it's good or bad? We listen to our reference music. Um, and so you have this reference music to basically evaluate the loudspeaker. And how was the reference music recorded? With microphones and equalization and recording te technology and so on. And how do you listen to a microphone? With a loudspeaker. And the question is now, what is the right thing? So um, basically every piece of the chain influences each other. And it's really hard to strike through that circle of confusion. And um, Floyd Tool's big endeavor was basically to establish standards so that you can say at least one element is fixed. And you say, this is really good. And so the rest of the circle of confusion gets a little bit, a little bit better. And, and the bis biggest, uh, let's say, proof for this uh, circle of confusion is if you just listen to your own music library and have a sort of a bit of a feel for, let's say, mixing or appropriate levels of bass and treble, is that a lot of music has different amounts of bass. And that is even more so with headphones, the case that you say, okay, this he headphone works well with this sort of music, or this headphone has a lot of treble and it works for most music, but not for this music, it's a bit too sharp. And so there's a lot of different understandings of how much treble or bass you should have. And that is one of the big, basically, the big offending parts of the circle of confusion. So um, that is what Floyd Tool recognized and tried to combat. And his first uh, angle of attack was basically loudspeakers. And um, he basically made a test um, where he first found out that sighted listening tests in audio are always, always garbage, to say it really uh, hardly, but it is that way. Um, and um, he, he was already, uh, he, I think he did his PhD in the 60s already in London, and then uh, he moved on to the National Research Council in Canada, where he hired Sean Olive, by the way. And then in 91, he moved on to, uh, on to Harman. He was hired there as a group VP. For research and when Floyd Tool was at Harman he did a uh, basically a listening test and he had on the one hand he had basically uh, two products by Harman <laughs> then he had a very small loudspeaker uh, and then a very large loudspeaker by competitors and here you see the results also uh, and what you see is that the Harman products were rated highly by Harman employees <laughs> surprisingly and what you see then in the blind listening test is actually that the small loudspeaker, which paired really, really badly in the sighted listening tests, was rated the most highly in the blind listening tests. So the test setup was really that uh, you had the loudspeakers behind the, uh, behind the curtain that was acoustically transparent, but you couldn't see through it. So um, he noticed really that the moment you cannot see anymore, first your perception of something changes because we are mostly visual animals in a sense. So like 50% of our brain capacity is taken up by visual processing. And uh, basically anything we see that determines basically all the other senses we have. And, and it's really the most dom dominant sense. And 
what he found out, and that is the most remarkable part, is once we are blind, actually, the preferences of most people converge, at least for loudspeakers. That was his finding. So as soon as a loudspeaker has a very flat, smooth re frequency response, is extended to, bo to both sides, so first treble and then also to the bass, he found out that bass accounts for 30% of our preference, uh, roughly. Um, and that is relatively smooth. So it doesn't have a lot of like uh, peaks or distortions. So if these criteria are fulfilled in a, in a free field, so not in a room, but really if you just measure it in an experimental setting, then people would generally prefer this loudspeaker. And that is really hard science. So it's like 95% agreement. And um, that is really basically his, his big achievement that, that we can confidently say if, if we measure a loudspeaker like that, it will sound amazing. That's great. And uh, that was already the case, like he found it out in the 80s. So, so loudspeakers are far ahead of, head, of headphones in, on, that, uh, <laughs> um, on that front. And, and by that virtue, we can, we can now look up a loudspeaker, for instance, on the internet. And if it's a reputable loudspeaker manufacturer, they will always present the frequency response sheet. And then we will say, OK, the frequency response is, is very flat on axis, so that is very good. And then basically a secondary effect of that is also the, um, the degree to what the loudspeaker also sends sound to the sides. And that should be very even as well. So there are some loudspeakers that um, have a very, very strong decrease of, loud, uh, of sound pressure level once it goes to the sides. And um, that is then unnatural, or it's very different depending on the frequency, but it should be as even as possible once the loudspeaker basically fires to the sides. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. So, so you don't need to go necessarily to a store and, and listen to a loudspeaker to know what it performs like. And it wouldn't be working well anyways because it's sighted, and then you can judge it any more fairly. But you can really just look at a measurement and say, okay, this will sound very good. Um, so you may say now that this uh, topic of, how to say, of, of loudspeakers is solved now. And I would say in a scientific way, yes. <laughs> in a practical way, no. So um, here you see, for example, the results of a study where people went around and, and put calibrated generic loudspeakers into over 160 control rooms, professional control rooms. And so these are factory calibrated speakers from the most reputable studio loudspeaker manufacturer in the world. And you see on the graphic that actually the, the divergence, especially in the base, is gigantic. So, so you have here, like at the 50% variation, you still have like 5 dB difference in the base between the loudspeakers, even though you have really all the same loudspeakers in all these different control rooms. And that means effectively that even, even if the loudspeaker science is settled and if even if every professional employs the same loudspeaker, then the room still plays a big room, uh, role in really shaping how the sound works, basically. And what is also not solved is really at every part of this circle of confusion that I already alluded to, there's a person behind it. So still, a person can still judge things very differently. So if it's just a mathematical equation, and we, we say now that the translation between each part of the circle of confusion is is now very, uh, how to say, very accurate, very standardized. Even then there are people be besides it that, that basically judge things always differently and, and mix differently. So I unfortunately believe that this circle of confusion will never be really gone. But uh, Floyd Tool really made an immen immense effort to, to push it back and to push for standardization and make sure that everybody hears the same thing. So, um, what this loudspeaker analogy also shows us basically is how far you can take it. Because on the one hand, loudspeakers are somewhat solved in a scientific sense. And yet, if you look in the industry, then you have two or three really, really reputable loudspeaker brands that do excellent studio loudspeakers, which are measurably really best in class. Um, but, but then you have 100 or 200 different loudspeaker brands, which are small and uh, which I'm actually not that great. Here's an example of a very, very expensive loudspeaker, which is not really the flattest frequency response in the world. And um, I would say that uh, that will tr never truly be gone. And I mean, that's fine. We are not on a crusade. Uh, but in the end, it's a very, very emotional topic, the topic of music reproduction. And, 
And so there will always be room for people putting sort of the art in the loudspeaker, even though the objective of science should be to take the art out of the loudspeaker and just make an, an honest uh, reproduction tool for the art, for the music. Um, so, so that sort of shows us, even if we advance the science of headphones to the degree that has happened with loudspeakers, it will never be that every headphone is basically state-of-the-art neutral or something. It will always be, uh, there will always be brands that do some sort of uh, their own flavor tuning to it. And, and that's just in the nature of music. That's it for Floyd Tool for today. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. It wasn't about Harman Target yet. We'll talk about it in the next episode. Um, I hope it was still really fun, even though it's not about headphones, but um, you'll find that if you dive deep in enough into audio that you'll always come back also to, to loudspeaker, uh, psychoacoustics and so on. It teaches you so much to get a bit more of a broad view. Um, Floyd Tool, he's also posting on some forums like uh, Audio Science Review. He's, I'm, I'll drop a link down in the description because it's really enlightening to see this person that knows probably more about audio than almost anyone else basically uh, sharing some of his knowledge. So that's really interesting to read up on. So have a great day.